So today we are starting with uh, what well, we're going to be talking about the topic of transforming your career um, by doing an MBA and then obviously specifically we'll be talking about our MBA. Um, I would like to highlight just quickly we are focusing specifically today on the full-time MBA. So we're not going to talk about the Global Flex online MBA, even though there's a lot of similarities. Um, the, the prices, the content, uh, I'm sorry, the prices and the, the execution of the program is different. And we have a separate webinar on that. So if you are um, interested in the Global Flex online MBA, um, it's not that you're going to be wasting your time here today, but there's going to be a lot of information that is specific to the full-time MBA. So if you want more information about that, um, either join another webinar in the future or um, reach out to us for more information about that. Uh, we also have a master in management program um, and today the focus won't be on that either. We're doing a webinar on that next week. The master in management program is for people with zero to three years of experience while the full-time MBA is from three years of experience onwards. Her average work experience is between eight to ten years. So um, just uh, to, to make sure that you are aware of the, the focus of today. So let me introduce myself. Uh, my name is Hermina and I'm in charge of the enrollment and career services team at Maastricht School of Management. Um, that means the team takes care of what well, the first contact point by the recruitment. Um, you can meet us at one of these events that we when we travel. Um, uh, but we also have that missions team that will review your application when you apply. And then when you actually join MSM, we have the student services, career services and alumni team. Um, that also then take you take care of you when you have graduated. So we like to see the whole life cycle of the student experience in this team. And joining me today is Inka. I don't know, Inka, if you just want to quickly say hello. Thank you, Hermina. Hi, everyone. Good afternoon. Well, it's nice to meet you. I do see some uh, familiar names in the attendees list. So good to have you here. I'll be handling the chat at the end of the interview also that we will do some uh, questions live. So if you have anything to add, uh, feel free to use the Q&A box uh, for any questions and I will be happy to answer along the way and keep some uh, for the end of the presentation. Thank you, Inka. And then we have some special guests today and I'm going to ask them to introduce themselves. Um, it's two of our alumni from last year and um, I'd like them to just introduce um, themselves by saying where they came from, their background, education and work experience and what they're doing now. So uh, ladies first, if it is. Yeah, sure. Uh, thank you so much, Armina. Hello, everyone. Very nice to meet you all. And um, I'm thrilled uh, to have been invited to this uh, event, and I'd be I'd be more than happy if I can help. Yeah, and your background? Yeah, definitely. Um, I'm Sepide. I am um, from Iran. Uh, back home, I have been working as an accountant, and for almost seven years. And uh, well, as an accountant, um, having done most of the jobs uh, related to um, routine, I'd say accounting, I felt like um, I need to give myself um, quite a challenge. And um, I felt that I actually um, lacked um, a generic view on my job. So um, I started searching for um, uh, universities and I came across MSM. I can, I can give you more information and detailed more information about that later on. And um, well, yes, after graduation, uh, I, I started working um, again as, as an accountant. This time, my favorite position I could achieve. Um, I'm working as a financial controller um, at uh, an esteemed company, DSM, which um, here in this area, they, they, they say they are very proud of. Very good. Thank you very much. Of course. Uh, Lawrence. Thanks, Armina. Yeah, I'm Lawrence from South Africa, close to Cape Town. And uh, my background is in humanities. And I did a master's between humanities and economics. And I worked in the nonprofit sector, to put it broadly. And the reason why I did an MBA was to um, do a career shift. 
as I was always asking people for money. I wanted to work a bit on the other side as well. So now I'm working in corporate services, mainly to understand how um, the people who give the money, how their minds work. So it was quite a big jump for me. I work at a boutique um, corporate service company close to my street. And yeah, we have offices in the Netherlands, in Luxembourg and in Belgium. So, and most of it is in Dutch. So it's quite a, a stretch. Of Perfect. Thanks, Lawrence. Um, let's go through to um, just a little bit of what to expect today. Obviously, there's a bit of an introduction. We will explain a little bit more about Maastricht University, um, the Netherlands, but we won't take too much time on that because there's a lot to cover today. So we'll look at, we'll cover uh, the basis of what that market actually needs. We're looking at the future skills, and then we're going to look at how the MBA can actually boost those skills um, and develop certain skills that you will need for the future. Um, and then we'll look at where, you know, where the students are now, how the MBA can actually help grow them from a, how the career growth happens from a statistical point of view before going into the practical information. Now, at the end, like Inka mentioned, there is a Q&A moment. Um, so if you've got any questions throughout the session, you've got two options. You can put them in the Q&A area. There's a Q&A chat box at the bottom. It's not the chat, but the actual Q&A. Um, and you can post questions there. Inka will be answering them throughout the session in any case, but she'll also be collecting them because sometimes the others don't see those questions. And she'll just be asking some of the key questions again at the end so, um, so that those questions also that everyone else can benefit from it. Um, and also, most importantly, don't hesitate to also ask questions to the alumni, not just me, because it's always nice to hear from their perspective. So uh, this is a good opportunity to hear how they experience things. So let's get started. As I mentioned, we did a recent webinar in, in November where we actually looked about what makes MSM experience unique. Then we looked at the full-time programs in more general, just both of them. And we actually went deeper into why Maastricht, why the Netherlands, what makes the Netherlands such an amazing country to study in, um, what makes a Maastricht such a beautiful city to, to study in. Um, but um, I just thought today we'll keep it rather short, and I just wanted to ask Lawrence and Sepeda, both of you, to just, in a nutshell, um, explain why did you choose the Netherlands and MSM and Maastricht to, to come study, um, and what did you really enjoy about Maastricht? So it's a sort of like a vague or big question, but see if we can summarize it. Um, and let's start with Sepeda, because you already touched on it quickly just now. You said you'd been looking at that. So... What made you decide on the Netherlands MSM Maastricht? Uh, well, um, um, it, it back home, um, it's been a while that it had been a while that um, I've been thinking of um, doing my master's degree out of the country so that I can gain more experience and just uh, to expose myself to a um, more various uh, experience, I'd say. Um, and um, I started first by uh, researching about different countries. And uh, I came to know that the Netherlands is one of the um, high standards in aspect of education. So I a little bit um, deep dived um, uh, into uh, different uh, universities. And uh, after a while, I came to know that MSM is actually one of the most prestigious and uh, the oldest, of course, uh, schools in the Netherlands, um, which is actually specialized uh, in uh, providing students with MBA. And I want to emphasize on international students because of the fact that I, I have seen friends who are currently studying in the Netherlands, but the school is somehow not fami very familiar with uh, how to deal with international students. So um, it's more of a challenge for students. Uh, I, can, I can see that from my friends now. And uh, yeah, these are the main reasons I actually chose MSM and being very specialized um, in what they're doing. Plus the fact that uh, I would never forget how supportive the staffs are and where back in time when I wanted to make my life's biggest decision, 
to emigrate to the Netherlands. Um, I can recall that even um, Alina, Steph, um, I, I'm sure that the people here would know them. Um, Inca, they were all like res very responsive, even late at night, even being on vacation. So that really assured me of that, um, assured me of, um, of me making a right, making a right choice. Really glad to hear that. Thank you. And uh, it is something we try really hard on because we know it is such a huge decision. Yeah, um, we want to make it as reassuring as possible for you. Yeah. Um, so good. Thank you for that feedback. Of course. Uh, Lawrence, what about you? Yeah, I must, I must be honest. I really didn't do a lot of research. So um, I was so happy in my job in South Africa. But two things. So one thing was like me and my wife told each other, like before we settle and start a family, we're really keen on having this international trip and journey, keen on working abroad. And um, one day after a difficult meeting, I realized I didn't have enough technical expertise in especially uh, accounting and finance in some of these nonprofit meetings. And I just one evening went on the internet and I had, yeah, MSM popped up, so you can call it fate or magic or whatever. So I didn't apply to any other university, but I'm not like, I don't regret it for one moment. I really, I'm at MSM and the Netherlands, because I think the Netherlands is really open for internationals. Um, I think, I don't know the rankings, but I think it's the best country in terms of English, accepting English. So um yeah, I, I don't regret my decision once, but I must um, confess that I didn't do a lot of research. I didn't attend one of these meetings, but uh, luckily it all worked out for me. I mean, it's great because we're getting to see both sides. You know, you get all different types of people when they, when applying. So that's always fun to hear. Um, and Lawrence, if you think back, uh, you arrive in Maastricht, you know, what was the wow factor for you for Maastricht? I grew up in a yeah rural town. So what I really enjoyed about Maastricht, it's a small city, but if you take a jog, you're out of the city for into nature. So I really like that. And it's so connected to Europe. So yeah, we travel a lot. So it's close to Belgium, to Germany, to Luxembourg, to France. So um, it's so central in a lot of aspects. And the culture here, yeah, it's still in the one sense you have the university that's really open-minded and international. And then you have the local environment surrounding that's still truly Dutch. Mm -hmm. So you kind of have a interesting experience also as a tourist being here. Yeah. Thanks. And so what about you? Um, well, to me, I used to live um, in the capital city in Iran. Uh, which is quite a crowded city um, and very populated. Um, I actually was looking for somewhere so that I can be at ease a little bit and feel more rel relaxed. Um, so to me, um, Maastricht is still the best choice. You can see that uh, after my even graduation, um, I'm currently leaving there. Um, but to be honest, um, when I started for searching for jobs, uh, my first opportunity came across in Rotterdam, which is quite a big city and crowded again and all. But I felt like, no, I, I don't want to do that. <laughs> this was mm -hmm. not coming from my heart. So I started searching more and more. And yeah, luckily, I, I, I could manage to actually get a job over here and live still over here. And what I really like about Maastricht, um, and adding to the fact that, yeah, as just Lawrence mentioned, uh, thanks to the university, the, the vibe here is quite international. And, uh, you know, being and living in an, in an international city feels like a bit home. You, you won't feel like you are not one of them. Yeah. Uh, plus the fact that people are very, very welcome uh, uh, an aspect of uh, like Dutch people being very hospital um, when it comes to international students, international people. Um, and, uh, you know, to me, Maastricht is like a combination uh, of, of 
different wheelings of mine. If I want to just go to the nature, it's very close. If I want to just uh, be near the river, it's two minutes walk. And, uh, you know, if, uh, if you want to prefer to actually be um, in a crowded place, just go to Centrum. I mean, you can do everything over here in Maastricht. If you, if you would like to sit in beautiful cafes, you can do that. Easy access. Yeah. No, very true. It's got the best of everything, if you ask me. Yeah. Um, I, I always like to say it's um, small enough to feel at home, but big enough not to get bored. But yeah. uh, once again, in comparison to Iran, it must be minuscule. <laughs> That's true. That's true. Um, right. But thank you both for, for that um, information or uh, perspective. Um, I just quickly want to go to um, for um, the, the 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 people joining us today a little bit just overview of Maastricht um, itself. So why MSM? Why Maastricht? Um, the first thing is that the University of Maastricht is one of the youngest universities in the world, and it is ranked as one of the best young universities in the world. And MSM is a business school within the university. So you get the advantage of being part of a big university vibe, which is triple crown accredited. So only 1% of all the business schools worldwide have this triple crown accreditation. So you have this assuredness of quality. Um, the campus is absolutely stunning. And then you have access to all those university facilities. But then as Sepede mentioned, MSM itself is one of the oldest business schools in the Netherlands. It was founded in 1952 and she also mentioned which we are quite proud of we, we actually specialize just in MBA and man, uh, so business administration and management um, that is what we do we don't have bachelor degrees we only do master degrees and MBA degrees and we only specialize in business administration and management we don't have any other courses that is us um, and so because of the unique location as Lawrence mentioned we're on the border with Belgium and Germany it creates a very international vibe and MSM itself has always been very international also you can see that's why I asked you all to put in the chat how many different nationalities are already present in this webinar that's what we also have in the class and since the beginning we've been focused on creating that sustainable mindset and I'll be talking a little bit about that later and we'll talk about the learning experience for those of you that find rankings important, it is also just good to know that the rank, the MBA is very well ranked. It's ranked in the top 10 in the Europe, number eight. Um, last year, we got the very good news that we're ranked as one of the best sustainable MBAs in the world. So we were ranked number three by the Corporate Night Ranking, which is the sustain best sustainable ranking in the world at the moment for business schools. And obviously, it has is recognized as a tier one business school. So those are just all other reassuring things to know about but now I'd rather just take the time to dive into the actual topic of career growth and skills that you need for that so if you've got any other information about MSM you can send us a, a, a chat or an email or um, we can call, have another call with you um, but let's dive into the topic of today so before I can tell you what we offer i think it's important to know what companies need and want so that we as a business school can constantly adapt so there's research that we regularly do um, and the first good news is that the dutch job market is doing quite well there are moments that is a bit more difficult obviously sometimes certain areas are struggling a bit more it also depends what background you have so some backgrounds find jobs much quicker some nationalities will find jobs much quicker but we have a career service department that helps every single person to be able to um, have all the tools necessary to find a job after the, um, the the MBA and we'll talk about that but uh, this is statistics that just came out that for 2024 um, well up till Q4 2023 and Q4 uh, Q1 2024 is looking to be carrying on in that same um, trend that the job market is still growing, um, that there are still more vacancies available than people on the job market. So that is always reassuring to know. But obviously, it's not something that we can predict for the future, but at least the trends are looking positive. Um, 
But now I want to say, talk a little bit more about the difference between hard skills and soft skills, because this is where we notice from a cultural perspective that some countries focus more on the hard skills and some countries focus more on soft skills. However, it is becoming more and more clear that for the future of your career, having those soft skills is what's going to make a huge difference in your career development. So the hard skills are technical skills, specific knowledge um, that you would need, like in engineering, for example, AutoCAD um, knowledge, while the soft skills is more like the social interactions you have with people and how to connect with them. So that's in the summary, and we're just going to look at that a little bit more. So if you look at what companies want, and this is based on the most recent um, research done by the World Economic Forum for 2025, so for next year, these are the top 10 skills that they are expecting. And these skills have been figuring in different orders, but more or less every year for the last, since about 2018. So we've seen a strong focus on creativity, problem solving skills, analytical thinking, active learning and resilience. Those are the ones that come up over and over again. And when um, the, the report, the World Economic For uh, Report also creates a report on the future of jobs, these are what they think are the skills that are going to be most important to continue to develop by 2027. So as the world changes and becomes more technological and more computers and AI and software take over jobs that we as humans are doing, to be able to stay relevant, these are the skills that will be important. So creative thinking is something that we can do, for example, that machines can't do. Um, the lifelong learning and um, you know self-learning, um, the being um, self-aware, the resilience and flexibility and agility, those are things that machines won't be able to do and that we need to learn to develop. Now, I'm going to go back to Lawrence and Sepeda and I'm going to ask you guys, if you look at these lists now and you think back to your MBA, which of these skills did you feel really um, were developed during your MBA. You might already have had some of them. Some of them are natural for some people. But if you look back at the courses, the way everything's set up, what really stood out for you during that year? Maybe let's start with Lawrence this time. Yeah, I think the the nice thing, what I enjoyed about um, MSM was the, how do you call it, the blended curriculum I can't even remember but the problem but problem based learning where you constantly work in groups so you have a topic say on accounting but throughout you have a group work project solve a case and present something and I think that created the whole teamwork environment but I think the two main ones on if I use this list is creative thinking and system thinking and that's why I think most people do an MBA is that you have the ability to kind of solve bigger problems, not being too technical in a certain field, but being able to combine a lot of different things. And I think the imp really helped me to kind of take a big picture. So even now I'm I'm I I need to do some technical stuff at, at work, but I a lot of the times in difficult meetings, I find that I can give a broader perspective, even though I'm a junior on the team, whereas people that have been working 10 years in the same job, they focus on being really technical in one thing. So I think the MBA really helped me to sometimes just step back and think, okay, what is our contributing factors in this um, situation? Yeah, no, very true, very true. Uh, Sepide? What about you? Um, yeah, definitely. So um, what I would choose, um, um, thanks to MSM, I would say that um, the assignment setup is in a way that uh, it's, it's designed to um, stimulate the real world, apart from the theoretical information you are being exposed to. So um, uh, Actually, our professors are um, allowing us to like apply that theoretical uh, concept to um, a practical scenario really helped me uh, to improve my um, 
I'd say, yeah, out of this list, I would say systematic thinking, which I can easily now apply to my job because I believe um, uh, here in the Netherlands, probably in Europe, I don't know, I'm talking over here, um, the, the way people are being grown up at school are totally different from what I, I myself experienced. Um, you can you can clearly see that how people are thinking, like being very level headed, very um, they're they're very very good at systematic thinking, and and uh, like their mind is so clear that everything is well organized. That's how they work. So yeah, really uh, the the uh, the way we were doing our assignments, specifically, I'm talking about so those group assignments we had to do with friends. And colleagues uh, really helped me to just boost my ability in this regard. Plus, um, I would refer to creativity thinking. Um, I'd never, to be honest with you, I'd never consider myself um, to be a creative person. But let me tell you this. I ended up with, uh, with writing a business plan for my master thesis, which oh, I never expected myself. So yeah, for me, these are the two I can mention. Yeah, really nice. And obviously, and we'll talk about that in a future slide, the resilience. Yeah. Because what be you guys go through in one year, um, I think after that you can handle anything, right? Yeah, yeah, I admit that. <laughs> right. Um, thank you for sharing that. Um, and we'll look at that in a bit more detail just now as well, but I just wanted to highlight that. And then something I wanted to mention as well, which is quite interesting, or I, for me, a scary thought, 65% um, of the children that have, are in primary school at the moment, so my son is in primary school at the moment, 65% six, uh, of those jobs have not been created yet. It's just um, scary to think that we can't prepare for the future jobs, but we can prepare for the skills. And so that's also why um, these soft skills are so important. Also, um, like I mentioned, a lot of those jobs are going to be taken over by the machines. Um, and so we need to start thinking about what are the jobs which will not be taken over machines. And obviously, these are all speculations. There's some trends because you can already start seeing things happening. Um, but they have started notice two tri uh, contradictory trends. Um, the first one is that um, in some of those really technical jobs that, uh, you know, the mechanical hands on type of jobs that a machine can't always do, um, or it's cost expensive for the machine to do. And then the other jobs will be the actual human centric jobs. So the ones where you have to work and train and develop and think and strategize um, in teams. Those are the type of jobs that will, um, uh, are, will be, you know, safer. Um, and so um, when they look at that, the, the sales and marketing jobs, so the more human centric ones, education and training, very obviously, um, and then business and financial management. So um, those are jobs where it's good to know that you um, there's more potential of staying safe for longer. And then the engineering jobs, the ones that are really at the top of that technical area. So those are what they're expecting from a trends perspective. So also knowing that the MBA can help you in stabilizing your, your you know, future proofing your career in a way as much as possible. So it's also important to think of that from a return on investment perspective. So now looking more specifically, and we've already touched on that. Um, but I'd like to, to discuss a little bit more the actual teaching philosophy. And uh, Lawrence, I think you actually mentioned that the problem-based learning, we actually call it the case-based learning. Um, can you maybe explain a bit more what that is, what that contains? What is this learning approach in the Netherlands that's different? The, the nice thing for me about that is I, I'm really practical. Um, I like to think I'm really practical, but... Um, the it, it usually started with a case study or a situation or a problem and then by the end of the week in, in, for example the group exercises or the group um, project you had to come up with a solution so instead of giving a lot of theory you start off by a real um, life case it out and now in the workplace it really helps me because that's how life works as well so i think I really enjoyed the the way that the course was presented. 
Um, I grew up in an education system where it's um, yeah, it was a lot of information, and you kind of had to study that and get it into your mind, but you never understood how that made sense in the world. And this is totally. And uh, Sepeda, because you also mentioned you were in a very different education system before coming to the Netherlands. If you think back to also your MBA experience, um, what stood out for you? What really helped you also thinking about how you're using it now in your career? Yeah, sure. Um, so um, back home, uh, well, I, I have my bachelor degree from Iran. Um, even at university, apart from school, um, normally we would go to class and we would have the course and uh, then you take the exam, you pass or fail. No one would care if you if you have realized or thoroughly understood what the concept of the courses are. To me here at MSM is like uh, you go to school, um, you have given the courses, you have given the necessary tools, necessary information, then you, you should go yourself and deep dive into what you have already learned so that you can learn it by heart. Um, I'm just thinking of an example. Um, since I have uh, majored in accounting, um, I had always seen uh, the financial statements. I know where to expect what and what goes where in the financial statements. But uh, having done accounting and finance, um, I believe that now I can actually analyze what I'm seeing as a figure. If I see those figures and those specific positions, what do they mean? And um, I would say now after having passed those core courses, even in my job, I can, I can easily see that I am doing a meaningful job. Mm. Yeah. So to me, That's things are, are are being more tangible, I'd say, after having passed those courses. And did you ever have a simulation game in your bachelor degree? Or was it the first time you that you experienced one of those? No, actually, I, I myself had, had never a chance to do such a thing. So uh, yeah, in my master's degree at MSM, that was the first time being How exposed to such a, yeah. Was it good? Yeah, definitely, definitely. And as I'm telling, um, I myself, I, I'm a person who learns more by um, by being exposed to more tangible and more practical courses rather than just memorizing some theoretical aspects. No, exactly. And that's the whole point of them. So it is true. We try as much as possible. And I'm glad to hear that from both of you, um, that practical element of it, the hands on experience, the group discussions, um, you know, and and experiencing this and learning from your mistakes. Um, and that's that's part of the whole the whole what we try and do. So I'm glad to hear that you experienced it like that. Um, yeah. Uh, yeah. Can I just jump in here? Yes. We're talking a lot about the group uh, assignments, but I also enjoyed the individual assignments because it mm -hmm. gave you the freedom to say they would give you a topic like digital transformation, but you can still most of the time pick your own topic that you're interested in. So there's a, a, a broad line of thought, and then you can dig into kind of the thing you are interested in. And I really enjoy that as well, because then you make the problem your own um, and kind of learn a lot by focusing on things you like. I'm glad you mentioned that um, because um, it is something where I always tell people that when you do an MBA, we do have a specialization phase and I will talk about it in the next section, but even throughout the year, you know, it's not just in your first specialization phase that you're specializing. Each assignment is a period of um, a moment where you do self-learning, when you go deeper by yourself into a topic. And like Sepeda mentioned, you actually get to see whether you understand it. You go, you do self-learning, but you go into the topics you find interesting. So the assignments, is, the individual assignments is always something that you can relate back to the topic, but at the same time, learn and grow in that area. So um, it's also done in that way to to promote that active learning that's one of those important soft skills for the future 
Um, so that actually was um, one of the things we'll talk about soon, but I'm glad you mentioned already because then we can go past it quicker. But first, I want to talk about the MBA being a pressure cooker because um, we've I, I mentioned that word briefly, and I thought maybe Lawrence and Sepid, if you guys can explain to the group how the 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 this, this um, MBA cycle works. So how did it oh, you know how did it work for you? What did your calendars look like? Yeah, okay. yeah. So I must say the pressure cooker, it is pressure, but I guess if you work full time and you make the MBA your, your job, it's also a privilege to study full time. So compared to working previously, I didn't experience the MBA being like um hectic in terms of I can't handle it. Yes, it's a lot of work, but I guess if you work three or five years um and you make the MBA your eight to five job it's handleable and the courses work like you have one week of class say course one is accounting and on the Friday of first week you have a group assignment and then the next week you only have one day of class that's mostly your career development um, courses and on the next Friday you have to hand in the individual assignment and that was nice because it gave you a lot of free time to work on your individual um, course or um, assignment. And um, yeah, there's nice library facilities and um, you can study with your class from different countries, giving you different perspectives. So you know, I really enjoyed the, the process. So that's perfect summary because basically you finish off that class, so you finish off accounting, and then you move through to the next course. So the two weeks blocked in, first week in class, next week working on those assignments and a few additional courses, and then you move through to the next course. And like that, each time you can take the time to really go deeper into one course at a time. Um, that's the way the MBA is set up for the full time. Um, now, the uh, curriculum itself, we talked about some of the skills that will be important, and we saw the creative thinking, we saw digital um, literacy, uh, we saw, um, you know, the, the co co complex decision-making, problem-solving, analytical skills, um, and then the cultural diversity, that sensitivity to cultural diversity. Those are all courses that uh, or topics that are extremely important for the future, skills that need to be developed. And these are also the courses that we're actually try and add that as part of the core curriculum in the MBA to help you um, prepare for that. Now, um, looking at those courses, Sepid, if you think back now, which of these courses, and it doesn't have to be the ones I highlighted, it doesn't yeah. specific for, you know, these skills, but um, if you look back now, which of the courses you actually did you not think would be interesting and actually ended up helping you a lot? Uh, well, to be honest, uh, when we first started the course change management, I didn't mm -hmm. know what to expect. Mm -hmm. But it was the sweetest course, I'd say to me, um, that I took um, at MSM. And uh, I still am applying this course from here and there to work even my personal life. Um, and I have learned a lot from that, specifically uh, what I really liked, as, as just Lauren also mentioned, we were open to choose any topics for our individual assignments. And um, I, I could never see myself uh, thinking of changing myself through this course. Uh, because when I started uh, investigating and just going through my individual assignments, uh, right at the time I started writing that, um, I felt like, ooh, I can actually change my my own personality based on what I'm learning on different tools. I started analyzing myself thanks to that course. And um, it really helped me to actually become or be actually more close to the person I would like to be in my personal life. Yeah, yeah, I, I experienced that myself. It actually helped me a lot in how I manage my team. Um, yeah. I remember I took a lot from that. Um, Lawrence, what about you? I'm using finance and accounting a lot now in, in my work. So I think it helped me a lot. But in terms of like 
the courses that really stood out for me is marketing um, and kind of marketing yourself as well. So I never thought about it in that way, but yeah, so marketing and um, the digital, no, the decision-making tools about mm. data analytics. Yeah. I It's not my strong point. Re really exciting because in the time chat gpt just came out we also had uh, digital or decision making tools that's a lot about data analytics and it was nice just understanding okay how does the whole ai process work and the lecturer i can't remember his surname but he was amazing Baba? yeah yeah, yeah. yeah he he's was teaching so... the same course at the moment so that's oh, why <laughs> so, yeah i think in terms of learning Really learned a lot in that those two perfect thank you um so in any case you can see it is often a lot of things that people learn even though they didn't think they would some of the courses are always very surprising but at least the curriculum is a nice well-balanced curriculum that covers everything to get that holistic experience of the MBA. Um, I also mentioned earlier on, we actually have a specialization phase. And during the specialization phase, you do four extra um, courses um, on one specific topic. So say now you choose digital economy, while well, you go deeper into doing four extra topics on that digital economy. Um, I do know that they are, so we're going to actually revamp, revamp that for the future. So it is possible that for 2025, it might already be like that, where we're actually going to combine, combine those four into two. So it will be um, topic one and two combined and topic three and four combined, um, because I'm sure Lawrence and Sipida, you probably remember the stress of, sort of submitting four assignments. At least like this, it becomes a bit more humane and the only two main assignments but the the credits will remain the same so it's three credits per course so it's in total is the 12 credits for the specialization phase and then students get to choose oh, well the MBA is 70 credits and then the students also get to choose between a thesis um, academic research paper consulting project and a business plan and both you and uh, well Lawrence you and uh, Sepeda have already mentioned Sepeda you did a business plan which you never thought you would do Lawrence you did a consulting project um, in South Africa if I understood correctly you mentioned earlier um, just very briefly, Lawrence, if you look back at the consulting project, did that help you in any way in the work you're currently doing? Yes, I think it's a lot of time you have to put into this thesis. So I wanted to do something like meaningful. I worked with the organization on a real problem for them. And obviously they didn't pay me, but it was still nice to feel that a lot of time and effort you put into this um project um, hopefully gives the company something meaningful and um, I do a lot of uh, in the corporate services that we provide we have a lot of clients phoning in and say we have a problem with this and we need and it's the same process that I took in the business project business consulting project in the MBA obviously a lot shorter than but you have to kind of understand the problem, get to a solution. And the whole MBA program get, gave me so many tools to get to a solution. So I, I use a lot of these skills in daily work now as well. Yeah, nice. And Sepeda, you said you did the business plan. Um, so I'm guessing you're not using it now, but were there any of those skills that you felt that you developed that really helped you that you can use for your, your career? Um, yeah, definitely. So um, I can give a bit, uh, a little bit of background of how I came up with this business plan. So where I come from is, well, uh, which is a bad luck is under the sanctions. And uh, when I wanted to, um, uh, apply for housings over here in the Netherlands, I had uh, quite a hard time because of the documentations and all. We could not actually transfer over here to Europe. Um, so after coming over here, um, I started living with um, an Iranian family for a couple of weeks, which was quite an interesting experience for me. Um, then I actually moved into my own house. So um, when it came, came for us to choose a topic for our thesis, um, I thought maybe maybe I can, I can create an application where I can connect um, families who have probably a spare room 
uh, with those international, specifically international students who, who might have just difficulties in finding a place over here. So um, as I just mentioned, um, I would before never consider myself uh, being a, a creative person, but um, you know, thinking of uh, difficulties over here you face, you might face actually like this housing problem, actually brought me to think of something new to, uh, to, to, a, to a solution actually. Um, and what specifically I would like to mention that that is what actually happens when you are doing the, assi the, the assignments and uh, you are actually attending courses um, and uh, being under the challenge professors might, might actually give you. Then you would think of um, a solution which I barely remember myself being so like strict um, um, strict on myself, improving that skill. So yeah, I would say solution finding is one of those skills that um, I actually could improve and I'm still applying this to my job because uh, currently I have a position um, as a financial controller, you need to really have um, a great holistic view on the business so that you can control everything. And if something is, is, something is going wrong, you are the one who is in charge in order to find a solution uh, to actually solve the problem. Yeah, no, really nice to hear that. Um, and really nice to hear that you both did such a different you know, version of the, the paper and that you can, the, the thesis and you could still use it. Yeah, indeed. Um, we've already talked about the assignment, so I won't take too long to do that. I just wanted to highlight to the audience today, we don't do exams anymore in one or two very specific cases. There might still be one, but as Lawrence and Sepid have mentioned, it's all about the assignments, um, the individual ones, you choose you can really use that opportunity to deepen your knowledge and then the group ones are the ones where you learn from one another there's a lot of discussions and that's also one of the things that uh, has been discussed here is the diversity um, the students come from all over the world they come from um, all different types of backgrounds even here today we've got um, it just with the two of you it's completely different backgrounds um, and that's what makes the experience so rich and it really helps you to see things from a different perspective it opens up your horizons to new ways of looking at things it increases your professional network which is an obvious one that's also one of the main reasons people often do an MBA but it also is, uh, we've had several cases where um, MBA students actually end up making company together or helping one another and I think in your case you had a classmate that had a business and from what I've understood from your um, uh, classmates that you all chipped in to help her Johanna with her um, you know business plan and making sure giving your ideas on how to set it all up um, and that's what it's all about it's about this this learning and supporting one another and in some cases even you know starting businesses together um, we've talked about the diversity, so I won't go too much into it, but it is one of the key fe features. And I know Sepide also already mentioned it. MSM has been completely international from the start. That's what makes us unique. Um, it's um, And it's something that we want to keep and protect because we find there's so much richness in learning from one another. Um, we're also very proud of all our teachers coming from all around the world. Um, some flying from Canada, America, um, um, Kuwait, Egypt, um, but we also have local professors um, like the change management professor that Sipida was mentioning, um, all with their business experiences and academic experiences. You get that mix of academic knowledge and real life knowledge so that your experience is more useful. And very important is that the professors are all approachable. So it's people that are actually have an open door policy um, that's, that are there to help and discuss and actually enjoy um, students coming and asking them their opinions. Um, so, uh, that was it. And then there are obviously for the MBA a few little extra things. One of them is an innovation week where you go focus a bit more on what's quite useful in the Netherlands at the moment. Agile planning, um, Scrum, um, uh, Kanban, service design, 
um, those type of things. So that's a topic, uh, a, a time that's taken to go deeper into that. And then we also have a mentorship program. And in the mentorship program, students get paired up with a local mentor who helps them understand a little bit more about the Dutch market, about understanding the, the Dutch mindset, how to do business um, in the Netherlands and things like that. Um, we also Can I have the add something? Yes, please do. And <laughs> I would like to take this moment to thank Inka um, because uh, I'm still in touch with my mentor <laughs> and he has been um, the best friend of mine during the last year um i mean um, when when we started um, being uh, given the chance to have a mentor i had no idea what a mentor might do how they can help but uh, i just uh, i just said yes to to actually what um, inca was pr providing us with uh so that i can gain experience for my own but um you won't believe me how how he could help me in a variety of uh, experiences I, I I had during the last year, um, starting with how I felt how I felt being alone, uh, traveling alone over here to the Netherlands, and um, helping out with my thesis. And now we're we're quite good friends for each other, and we're still in touch. Thank you for that. Oh, that's beautiful. You're welcome. Happy to be here. Happy day. <laughs> So for those of you wondering, Inka is in charge of the mentorship program and she also takes the time to get to know each student's wishes and tries to match, find the best match either from a personality or background perspective and uh, try to connect so that you can really get the most out of it. Um, for time's sake, I'm not going to talk too much about the career and personal development track, even though it is something very important because this is the part where we try and really develop everything that's non-academic so that it all makes more sense from a whole holistic perspective. Um, but we do give you a lot of trainings and workshops, and we have done several other webinars on this. So it is worthwhile to talk about this, but I'd rather just talk a little bit more because Lawrence, I know you also did that, the student challenges, because that's something we were quite proud of as well. It's where we use everything you're learning in the career service workshops, you know, the networking, the presentations, um, the, the, the CVs and all of that. Um, and then you're using it in real life in a company. So maybe explain a little bit about the SDG challenges that you took part in. I think there were so many opportunities that MSM created for us apart from the studies. So them was um, soapbox events where you go into a company and the company would give you a problem that they are facing and you have a day to solve it. And the company actually pay you for the day. So that was quite nice. And then throughout the year, we also had the Sustainable Development Goal Challenge where you team up with, uh, I think it was four or five classmates, and you also get a real challenge from a company. And you have then, I think it was months to come up with a solution. And in those three or four months, you communicate with the company, you go to the company, and then eventually you present a plan that they usually try to implement. So it was also nice bridging the gap between the academia being the MBA and then the Dutch market where you go into these companies and yeah, they show you around and tell you about the kind of problems they face. No, definitely. And it is something we really believe in because it's that you, you've got difference between hands on experience in class when you're discussing case studies and then it's hands, hands on experience in a company in real life. And then you realize academics is all nice and beautiful and all of that, but real life is messy and then trying to adapt and mix. So it's also part of that learning the skills and using them to, um, you know, to apply that knowledge. Um, so just to summarize, before we go into the practical details um, about how we can help you through the MBA to make you more attractive to the job market, well, firstly, is obviously the courses. You will have seen the different courses um, will help you. Lawrence, for example, was able to go from a very different field into what he's doing now in business consulting, especially in financial areas that he wasn't doing beforehand. Um, you know, these specializations, they're important topics, topics 
topics that are useful for the future. The hands-on learning, we've everyone's mentioned this several times, but it helps with the complex problem-solving skills and the creative, creative thinking development. The individual assignments are really useful for that active learning and critical thinking, constantly trying to come up with these solutions. The group assignments are super important for good communication skills, especially multicultural communication skills and the teamwork. The self-awareness that you work on throughout the year of being challenged in these group works to, to, to conti continue to develop your strengths. Um, there's a lot of presentations, so a lot of presentation uh, development and communication skills. The diverse class helps with the cultural awareness, managing people and coordinating skills. The pressure cooker, the time management, the stress management, the adaptability, all of those are skills that were on that list um, with the resilience. And then obviously the career and personal development track, we call it CPDT for short, handles, helps with the practical tips, the workshops, the networking, and you get to use all of these skills in more practical setting. So just also to summarize, because this is a question we get quite a lot from people in the, uh, you know, from chats and emails and um, so where do people end up? Well, the first answer is everywhere. It is a very global mix, but over the years, we have noticed more and more people stay in the Netherlands after their studies for at least a few years because they, like Lawrence mentioned, want to get that international experience first. So 78% um, of the students after their studies have ended up in the Netherlands and the European neighboring countries. And the others obviously found outside of the Europe, some went back to their companies, some went back to their countries and some went to other countries. And then um, we, based on our um, most recent survey that we did last year, 94% of them had um, a better job than before, or at least the same, and 88% of them had a salary increase. So those are always nice statistics just to see. And then um, also from recent years, some where they end up, the, the truth of, of the matter is, generally speaking, the situation of what Sepeda said, she was a, in accounting, she's still in accounting, just in a different position, her dream direction of the job. Most of the time, people um, stay in the area of comfort that they were already interested in, but we also get people that go into something completely different. So it really depends on your situation. Um, but you can see a lot of the familiar names, big companies, but also small companies, some going to startups, um, all different types of industries. And I know, uh, Lawrence and Sibida, your year as well, you've got classmates that are um, in all different companies here um, doing really well. I know um, there's one or two in, uh, one is in uh, Spain, um, Barcelona. Two, <laughs> Anyone actually. Else? Two? Yeah. Okay. Nice. Bali. Okay, okay, yeah. cool. Um, I didn't even know that. Um, but it's just, uh, um, you know, you've got quite a lot of people that are doing really well um, after their studies and so then within the same region, but others, um, you know, switching career paths like Lawrence did as well. And what we do notice the biggest difference actually is not what you do just after you study, finish studying. We notice, and this is something that Lawrence also touched on, the quick career progression after, within two years after, because when you are sitting in those board meetings and um, the, these people are all talking with very specific, um, you know, focuses and you come with understanding business as a whole and you come up with a more creative solution or you understand and you can break down a complex problem into more systematic thinking approach, um, that's how you then start seeing that the MBA is really going to have an effect. So in the next two, three years, that's where we see that all the students really grow into, um, into different positions. So those are just some of the examples how within two years the, the, the people have grown into new positions. So finally, just a little bit of practical uh, information. And once again, I won't go too long into this, but uh, the MBA for 2024 is 33,000 euros. It's a lot of money. So there are a few discounts and scholarships available. And Inkaka will send all the links and information. So if you want to know more, you can contact her. 
Um, but for 2024, there's a maximum discount of 35% with the acceptation of the academic uh, excellence and women ambassadorship. Those are uh, slightly higher, but there's a, a very limited uh, amount of people that get that. There's a sort of the two prestigious uh, awards. Um, so if you have any questions about the scholarships, don't hesitate to contact us. Also, um, regarding the MSM uh, application, if you are interested to join the program, well, you can connect via our um, online application portal, the campus.msm.nl. There's a lot of information you need to either upload and then on the websites or on this application portal, there's also motivation that you need to give, um, that you need to write. I can just personally here recommend to avoid using chat GPT. Now, Lawrence mentioned just now how amazing chat GPT is, and it is definitely an amazing tool which you'll learn to use and properly develop during the MBA if you don't already know how to. But it is very obvious to us when we get this perfectly typed out motivation letter um, that it is not sincere or written by a human. So <laughs> it is something that we like to actually see your real motivation. We like to see who you are. So take the time to do this properly because it actually does make a difference in the application process. Um, then there's an application fee to submit your application and then you follow with an interview. We will ask you some questions to make sure your motivation matches with what we have to offer and vice versa. And then if you are admitted, then you have the opportunity to um, either complete a GMAT or a GRE. And if you don't have a GMAT or a GRE, then the alternative is completing four online courses that you need to do before the start of the, uh, the, the program, plus an academic writing course. So those are just the two options that you have, but it's only something you have to decide once you know if you've been admitted into MSM or not. And once again, if you've got any questions about that, you can reach out to Inca or myself or Vessel. And so all the contact details are over here in the next slide. So those are our recruiters, Anina, Inca and Vessel. So don't hesitate to reach out to them or to our admissions office if you've got any questions about your degree. Um, you can chat to our students and our alumni. We have an actual place for that. So if you want any information from them about their experience, like what Lawrence and Sebade shared today, you can reach out to them via our website. And then if you want to have watch more videos, like I've mentioned, I've referred to some of the previous um, um, webinars we've done. You can go onto our YouTube uh, channel and you'll see all the, the webinars there. Um, and we are coming to several other countries that I saw on the list today. Um, so if you want to see if we're going to be in your region, you can check out um, our the list of events um, and uh, then uh, say, uh, may, take the time to come meet us when we are in your country. Um, so that was in a nutshell what I had to say. We are a little bit over time, but I saw there were a lot of questions happening in the chat. So Inka, maybe you can take out a few of the ones that are especially useful for um, the alumni that uh, maybe Lawrence and Sipita can answer and then uh, Absolutely. Um, Sipi, the question for you, how important is it to learn Dutch language um, for finding a career? Um, sorry, could, could you please repeat your question, oh, Inka? How important is it to learn the Dutch language? Uh, well, to be honest, uh, when I started applying for jobs, um, I would see that uh, there, are, there are jobs out there which require professional Dutch language. But I would still apply for that. <laughs> and the first job contract I received um, was actually uh, requiring uh, a professional Dutch language knowledge. Mm, but it really depends on how you approach people. What I did to acquire this uh, is that I, I loved the, the position uh, that was uh, vacant. Uh, in that specific company. And I actually, through the motivation letter I wrote, I show that I'm really interested in the job, but I am a beginner in Dutch language. And uh, they, they actually offered me, offered me the job at the end. But uh, since that was, the, that was the job I, I actually got in Rotterdam, 
uh, I try to actually look more for more opportunities over here. And that's the reason I then move. But um, in general, um, for finance and accounting, I can speak that it really does not matter how much uh, knowledge you have in Dutch language. If you know it, definitely it's a plus for you, for your CV. Um, because that's how you can actually um, integrate into Dutch market. So um, I would say in the first step, that's not something you should worry about. But if you invest on that, uh, you will definitely see how you can actually improve your um, networking specifically, uh, which actually exposes you to um, a broad range of opportunities. Yeah. But Lawrence, you, you only do it in Dutch. Yes, uh, my home language is Afrikaans, so it helps a bit with the Dutch. So my Dutch level is now B2, but it's still difficult to work full-time in Dutch. But mm. the job shortage is so big. Like, an example is we currently have open positions for interns, and all of the applications are non-Dutch people. Mm -hmm. So I think it's becoming more and more common for even these local companies to getting international staff as there's a skill so shortage. Yeah, that's it's, true. Yeah, there are a few jobs where knowing Dutch definitely has an advantage. Yeah. Yeah. Um, if you're in sales and you're going to work locally in the Netherlands, sometimes they require Dutch. Or if you're HR, um, sometimes you struggle a bit more with not having Dutch. But like you say, Sipida and Lawrence, in most cases, um, if you're willing to learn it, for them, that's enough. That's true. Yes. And you will actually um, provide yourself with a, a, a competitive advantage if, if you can learn that. All right. Thank you. Sure. Question for Lawrence. Um, what do you think? How challenging is the MBA for someone with 10 plus years of work experience? Um, I saw the question. Some of my classmates that they were a bit older. It is um a challenge to get into academic writing and referencing and all of that but there's a lot of help from the side of msm so i like a month or so and then you're into it so i think obviously it will be a big adaption to get into academics again but it's not like i i experienced the mba being something hardcore phd academics and the like working force practical stuff so i think it's the msm really helped to guide us to reference correctly use the right sources and all of those um yeah academic stuff all right thank you very much um question for hamina um how often does msm stay in touch with alumni um well, actually, Lawrence and the Sefido should uh, tell them how often we spam them. Um, no, what we do is we do actually try to 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 stay in contact with our alumni. We know that they're one of our most valuable resources, um, but also because we just really like our students. Um, so that helps. Uh, but we do two big networking events per year, one in the northern part of Am uh, in the Netherlands and one in Maastricht. Um, one is at the beginning of the year and the other one is uh, halfway through the year like that it's sort of like spread and then we um when we do travel we do organize alumni events in the cities we're in um so i know one of my colleagues was just now in mexico and bolivia uh sorry in mexico and uh, bogota and he did events for them there um with our alumni um and another one went to vietnam she did an event there and the philippines so you know wherever we go we try and catch up with our alumni um, but more importantly, we also are looking at, and we've already started that, but we're trying to do that even more, um, is to do some online trainings to also keep um, alumni um, interested uh, to, to continue that lifelong f uh, learning philosophy that we have at MSM. Um, so uh, Lawrence and uh, Sepeda, you don't even know that, but we're working on a LinkedIn training that we'll be informing you about very soon um, that you can join online. And we're going to be doing, you know, uh, we did one on leadership a few weeks ago. Um, and so we just, you know, uh, things like that to keep our alumni also active um, within the environment, because for us, that's really important. 
Thank you, Amina. Um, there's uh, actually two questions combined. Um, who arranged the visa and the housing? In what way so, do we help them? Yeah, so the visa we take care of, our admissions team, and that's what Sepeda also said, the staff uh, is really supportive. I totally agree. Steph and uh, Leslie, uh, the, the admissions office, really try and help each person. They tell you exactly what you need. So you need to send all the documents to MSM. Once the payment is in, that's often the biggest, obviously, hurdle, um, then we can start taking care of the visa process for you. So we apply for your visa to come study at MSM. And then from the housing perspective, it is always a big issue. So we recommend that people start applying to look for houses sooner rather than later, because the later you look, the less are available. Um, what often happens, and Sepida, you actually mentioned you did that yourself, is people find something temporary for the first two months because then from November, things actually calm down again because then a lot of the students that did a bachelor study that drop out and then a lot of rooms become available. But it is crucial to obviously have something for the first two, three months that you're there. Um, MSM does have quite a lot of uh, recommendations that we have a website for. We have someone helping with the housing that's in contact with all these different places. We've blocked rooms for our master and management students and some for the MBA. Um, but it's first come, first serve. And after that, if you are too late or you took too long to make your decision, the chances are not that the housing isn't available anymore, but that the prices go much higher because the only ones left are the very expensive ones. So that's um, that's the situation. But I know the University of Maastricht is actually investing a lot um, in creating new housing um, in Maastricht. So I'd say of all the cities in the Netherlands, it's probably one of the cities with a less serious problem than, I mean, Amsterdam, Utrecht, Rotterdam. It's an absolute nightmare. Um, Maastricht, our students always find something, either temporary or permanent, but it's still, for many students, it is a serious stress point. So our recommendation is to start thinking about this soon, and the sooner you apply, the sooner you can really start making your decision and start looking around. So hopefully that helps. Thank you, Amina. And in line with that one, what do you recommend to have safe for living expense? And what do I recommend for? Living expenses, like what okay. does someone need to, uh, to so, keep in mind? Um, that has actually just increased. It used to be in around 12,000 euros last year. And I've seen now that the Dutch government actually increased that. And I think they increased it to about 15,000. I'm not sure, 15 or 16,000 is on our website. Um, and that's what we, the Dutch government recommends for housing and food and, you know, just being able to live without going hungry or homeless for a year in the Netherlands. And Maastricht is a little bit cheaper than the rest of the Netherlands, um, maybe even quite a lot cheaper. I think it's 20 to 30 percent cheaper than Amsterdam or Rotterdam. Um, but it's still, I mean, it's it's Europe. So there will be things that are more expensive to your country, depending on where you come from. All right. Um, thank you, Amina, uh, Lawrence. I believe that's all the questions um, that were asked. Well, I answered already some of them during the webinar. Um, my email address is also mentioned in the chat. So if there's anything, feel free to just let us know. Myself, uh, Vesela, Alina, Hamina, you can all approach us. And I typed also that we will be sending a follow up email at the beginning of next week with the recording as well. Yeah. And I just want to say a very, very, very big thank you to Sepeda and Lawrence. Your input was very amazing. I loved all the information you gave. I It made me want to study at MSM again. Um, so thank you for taking the time today. And um, my pleasure. Yeah. And all your stories and all the advice you gave, it was really useful. So thank you. Thank you very much. First, anytime. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Bye-bye. Bye. All right. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.